Last time we looked at while loops, the first type of loop in Python. Today we're looking at for loops, the second type of loop. For loops are more specific than while loops, but still very useful. They're built for sequences, so before you start looping, you'll need a sequence. I'll use a string and set that to x. Then we can write our for loop. Start with the keyword for. Follow that with the name of a new variable. I'll name mine letter, and you'll see why in a second. Then the keyword in, followed by our sequence and a colon. We learned about the in operator in our lists lesson. But don't get confused, this means something different. You probably guessed it. After your colon, you can start a block on the following lines. So, what does the for loop do? And how many times does it repeat? The for loop will repeat its block for every item in the sequence. In the block, I'm just going to simply print hi. Let's look at the output. As you can see, the loop ran five times, so we have five prints in the terminal. It ran five times because x is five items long. Pretty simple. The for loop also gives you which item it's looping over. This value is stored in the variable you specified, right before the word in. In this case, the variable is letter. Instead of printing highs, let's print letter. The value of letter changed each time the block ran. It started with the first item in the sequence and ended with the last. This is called iteration. The loop runs through each item in the sequence, or iterates over it. Also notice how if you read the instruction like a sentence, it kind of makes sense. For every letter in X, do whatever, or in this case, print. Let's look at an example using a list. This is the exact same setup, except it uses a list of animals instead of letters. Not too exciting. Loops let you do cool things with sequences because they don't depend on a set number of items. This program starts with a list of numbers, which holds test scores. Then a variable called total is used to keep track of the sum of all test scores. The for loop goes through every number in the list and adds it to the total variable. After the loop runs, we find the average by dividing the total by the length of the list. When I run this, you can see that we get the expected output. Like I said, a for loop doesn't depend on a set number of items. So if I add six more test scores to this list, the program still runs completely fine. Sometimes, however, you do want a for loop to depend on a set number, and you can achieve that with the range command. The range command returns a sequence of numbers that you can use in a for loop. To see things more clearly, I'll cast to a list in the interpreter. It's pretty straightforward. If you want a sequence that's 10 items long, call the range command with the number 10 as an argument. The returned sequence starts at 0 and ends at 9, for 10 total items. Likewise, if you want 50, give it 50. It'll take whichever number. It's a weird idea, but just like most things in programming, the range command starts counting at 0 instead of 1. This is helpful with lists later on. If you want it to count from one number to another number, you can specify a start and end to the sequence. If I give it 10 and 20, it'll start at 10 and end at 19, again 10 items long. If we try to count backwards, say from 10 to negative 10, it doesn't return any numbers in the list, and that's because by default, it counts up by 1. To change the amount it counts by, give it a third number. In this case, giving negative 1 will count down by 1s. This is handy if you want to count in tens, or even numbers, or negative multiples of 7, or whatever you'd like. That's about all there is to the range command, so let's see how it would work in a for loop program. Of course, you can make counting loops of all different kinds but we did that with while loops, which wasn't very exciting. This program prints out items in two lists at once. Here we have two corresponding lists, where they are the same length, and an item in one list has a value that pairs with it at the same position in the other list. That means green goes with apple and red goes with strawberry. Because you can't make a for loop that goes over two items from different lists, I instead make the loop go over the range of the list. This way, it counts to the length of the list starting from zero. I use that number to select an item from both lists, and then print it out. 
This lets me access two or more items at the same time. For loops are also an easy way to make modified versions of lists. Let's say you have a list of booleans, and you want to flip each value in the list. There's not really an easy way of doing this. You have to go through each item and flip them one by one. Fortunately, for loops are great at that. I'll do this two ways. The first way, I'm going through each item in the list, flipping the value, and then adding that onto a new list called new values. This way, I end up with a modified list and an unmodified list. You might need that, depending on your program. The second way, I just change the original list to have different values. Instead of looping through every item, I loop through the range and set the item at the index to the opposite value. At first, you might want to loop over the list like normal, and then set the variable to the new value. But that actually doesn't work. Modifying the given variable doesn't do anything, because it's just a copy of the item in the list. OK, by now we're starting to make useful programs that accept all types of data. Let's write a simple algorithm to find the largest number in a list. And by the way, an algorithm is just a set of steps that solves a class of problems. To find the largest number in a set, you'll need to compare them to each other. Here's how it works. After my list of numbers, I create a variable called largest and set it to 0. Then, I simply loop through each number in the list. If the number is greater than the one in the largest variable, that number then becomes the largest. Since it'll go through every number in the list, it will find the greatest number out of all of them, as long as it's above zero. Cool, it worked. In the output, it shows how it went through each number in the list and kept track of the biggest value. Now you can use this piece of code to find the largest number in a list, if you ever needed to. Or you could use Python's built-in max function that does the exact same thing. But the idea carries. For loops can be used to compare items in a set. Think about how you can modify this program to find the longest string out of a list of strings. Python doesn't have a built-in function for that. Lastly, you may also want to nest for loops in certain cases. Since one loop can compare values in one list, you can use nested loops to compare values in two lists. Here's a common use case. Let's say we have two lists of names. One is full of students in math class, and the second is students in art class. How can we find which students are in both classes? You'd have to go through every name in the first list and look if there's a matching name in the second list. In this example, each list only has 10 names, but if it was more like 100 names or larger, it would take forever to find. Instead, we can use nested for loops. In this program, I go through every single student in math class. Then, for each math student, I go through each art student. If the two names are equal, then the student is in both classes, and I add that name to a list that will remember those students. When the nested loop finishes, I print the smaller list again with a for loop. Pretty practical. Notice how I use different names for each loop's variables. That's because you can't really keep track of two things with only one name. Nested for loops are also a way to iterate over every item in a two-dimensional list. That's just a list where each item is another list. Here we have a 2D list, which is four by four items large. To access a single item, first you need to select one of the smaller lists, which kind of act as rows in a grid. Once you select the list, you can then select an item from it, using a second selector. Think of it like the first number selecting the row, and the second number selecting the column. This is how you'd print the second item in the third row. Using that concept, we can use for loops to print every item in the entire grid. For every row in the grid, and every item in that row, print the item. Cool. I know that was a lot of use cases in a single video, but that's because for loops can be used in many places, and they're pretty handy. Take a chance to practice what you've seen here, and pretty soon you'll master iteration. Alright, code dog out.